Gresham College presents Debussy Text and Ideas Verlaine's Poetry Performed Through Debussy's Musical Sounds by Dr. Mylène Dubou Forac. This study begins with the hypothesis according to which Claude Debussy would have chosen Paul Verlaine's poems for their innovative manner in the frame of tradition. In his melodies, uh, The Ariettes Oubliées, on text of Paul Verlaine, chosen among romances sans parole, Claude Debussy dissociates his work from a habitual type in the genre of French art song. Verlaine's poetic techniques of contrasts and breaks, of repetition, of sound saturation, enrich the new organizational research of Debussy. The vocal lines wobble from a recitative to large curves in arabesque in the same line. The formal vocal melisma give way to a syllabic prosody without any repetition of word. And then harmonic motion is more a continuity of colors than dependent of structural ten tensions. The renewal of language as well as innovation in the known frame would be notable, notable points of convergence between the research of Claude Debussy and of Paul Verlaine. Searching, as everyone knows, music above all, Verlaine reworks the habitual codes of French versification by rethinking meters, rhymes, literary formats, but always in the tradition of poetry. This similarity of creative attitudes is the starting point of this study. If Debussy chooses the text of a poet renewing the matter in the matter, wouldn't it be for him a support to renew music in this music genre? Even more, would it be possible to think that this first compositional period of his life, dedicated in great part to write and to rewrite melodies on poems of Verlaine, would be a period of preparation, of maturation, of the modernity of its langu his language, influenced by the work of the poet. As well as Paul Verlaine shocks because the metrics remain in very flexible lines, Claude Debussy innovates uh, because vocality and motive progression reside in different ways in his music. To support this hypothesis, I will begin with the poetic work of Verlaine in its poem Spleen, and I will intertwine the musical answer which Debussy offered in his last melody of the collection uh, Les Ariettes Oubliées. Following step by step the poetic behavior, I will raise the parallelism between the management of the poetic and musical materials, which leads to rethink the logic of progress of rhetorical discourse, either poetical or musical. In his poem Spleen, Verlaine leads in parallel two types of discourse, passage of storytelling and direct speech by the narrator. The disposition of the poem in couplets allow receiving in a more sensitive way the alternation of story and speech, which mixes the description of natural phenomenon and the personal expression of the narrator. But this foreseeable linearity is broken progressively by the narrator's flood of feelings confronted to the evocation of the landscape. The articulation of this uh, level of break between story and speech in the poem is the first challenge offered to the progress of the musical discourse which Debussy raises. To recall the spleen, object of his poem, Verlaine chooses to demonstrate tension between past and present. The organization in, co in couplets is significant for this. Recalling duality between the description of past and the narration of the present, alternately during first four couplets, then mixed for the two last couplets. The speed of the cadenza of stanza offered by the couplet punctuates in a fateful way the time, leaving few places for the outpourings of the lyric subject's feelings. The association of two lines and of two temporal units with the couplets allows also the representation of the duality of the loving relation invoked again and again by address to the loved one with to you, vous, formal you, cher, dear, 
and the presence of the lyric subject, je, very often, I. Spleen is written in octosyllables. The choice of the length of the line is also significant. The octosyllable, the longest in short lines category, as the French linguist Benoît de Cornelier notices, stretches the line at the furthest of its stressed tension. The choice of this measure, with the accent at the end of the line located as far as possible, without necessity of césure, reinforces an experience of slowness, which contributes, in spleen, to the semantic field of the expansion of time offered by the poem with the words infini, infinite, attendre, to wait, la, bored. The passages of story, very flat in their stretch enunciation, use the octosyllable in its extreme fluidity without strong cut, while the passages of speech are shed into light by a black punctuation, factor of irregularity, with a comma in line three, comma and dash in line seven, two commas in the last line. Speech, introduced in red, gaining the upper hand on the description, notated in black here, uh, in the two last couplet, shows officially, poetically, the expressive excess of the narrator splashing on the nature which encircles him. The anaphora of the three last lines takes at the same time story and speech in an amalgam which describes the landscape as well as the feeling of the narrator, the spleen. It is here really a watercolor, according to the title of the subgrouping of the collection uh, Among Romance Sa Parole. The title is Aquarelle. In Debussy Melody, Claude Claude Debussy makes the same progression, couplets by couplets, with the same length of melodic sentences in music. A line is quasi-systematically distributed on two measures for the whole melody, except for the last line, which is stretched. The alternation of recitation in linear movement for the description in the even couplets of, oh, with more animated and more flexible melody for the narration of the odd couplets is also found in voice and piano parts. As an example, the first couplet is recited as a recitative. The linearity of enunciation of descriptive naturality are recreated in music by this recitative in the low tessitura of the voice without the support of the piano. The third couplet follows twice, twice the same regular downward movement in a very regular way. And then the fifth couplet, as well as the first line of the sixth couplet, recites the text on intervals using the arpeggio in a very regular way again, uh, rhythmically, as we can see for the scansion, uh, scansion of uh, De la Campagne Infinie, uh, for example, uh, with always the same um, length of notes. On the opposite, the even couplets bearing the expression of the lyric subject follow more sinuous vocal lines, rhythmically unstable, broken by silences and alternation of pitches, and using rhythmic patterns leading to a movement, like the dotted eighth note with its sixteenth notes leading its resolution on the following done bit. For example, both following lines of the second couplets are entirely in opposition of the from the first couplet. First of all, by the tessitura I used, and by the ambitus that is very large for this uh, genre. The rhythmic disposition of notes is freer, introducing very various prosody in link with the diction of the text. This creates opposition with the monotony of the regular eighth notes of the first line, which is so. The tempo is agitated, con moto, accompanied by a crescendo for line three, then by two successive crescendo for line four. Debussy follows step by step the proposals of Valen's poem. On the contrary to vocal lines, which would be meant to be melodious to answer the type of French art song in the 1880s. The piano 
lifts all the place to the voice for the beginning of the song, then it will take little by little a more significant importance by the use of themes and musical motifs unifying the whole work. This musical treatment will be the object of our second part. The composer seems to answer the choices of enunciation in Valen's poem differently for each couplet by getting closer to what would be a descriptive declamation or of a passionate declamation. But these melodic fragments, always different for each couplet, put in trouble the principle of coherence of the musical material of a piece at the end of the 19th century. Debussy becomes attached to other parameters than those of the speech of enunciation. He is attached to repetition and saturation of the colors present in the poem. And this allows him to accomplish in another way the semantic unit necessary for the tonal music frame. Always in a research of signification, thanks to poetic techniques, Dallin works with the tones, with the length of syllables, to recall the spleen of the lyric subject, trying to illustrate orally the feeling of time in the poem. And the length of the declamation of the text seems stretched by the delivery imposed by the choice of word and groups of words. The difficulty of diction and the emphasis with repetition of words and syntactic structures, the paronomas, repetition of same sounds as T, D, R in bold here, or the use of double vowel, E, U, E, W, U, E, and other, <laughs> underline here, or double consonants, participate to this lassitude of things. The heavy side of the spleen is transcribed here by the words themselves, as we can hear if we declaim the text. Les roses étaient toutes rouges, et les lierres étaient tout noires. Cher, pour peu que tu te bouges, renaissent tous mes désespoirs. Le ciel était trop bleu, trop tendre, la mer trop verte et l'air trop doux. Je crains toujours ce qu'est d'attendre quelque fuite atroce de vous. Du hou à la feuille vernie et du luisant buis, je suis là, et de la campagne infinie et de tout, fort de vous, hélas. The clattering of sounds makes sensitive the clattering of colors and the excess of feelings with too lively colors, as tout rouge, very red, um, trop bleu, too blue, trop vert, too green, uh, du luisant buis, shining boxwood. Excessive sound is significant of too violent visual sensation, where story and speech seem divided into couplets. We can point out that tones are led on the, at the same time throughout all the couplets, already mixing feelings coming from description and feelings of the narrator. These same tones, reduced around the core of consonants and of associations of vowels, create a sound color which unifies the text, participating of visual lassitude by excessive sound redundancy. In the same way, in Debussy's setting, melodic repetitions appear in a particularly dense way throughout the work. The main motive of the melody appearing at the beginning, at the end, and regularly during the piece, establishes itself as a continuously, sorry, <laughs> as a continuously returning theme, just like the endless reemergent sounds of despair in the poem. This theme is almost always the same, only its environment is changing by a kind of process of evolution of its decor, more than a process of development of variation. Displayed without accompaniment in introduction, it is tonally ambiguous and driven in a sinuous way toward the lower second degree to the fifth degree, assuming lately a tonic of F minor. This motto come back, comes back six times throughout the piece. Transposed only for two occurrences into Mizu 22 and 25, then again in the original key at the end, linked to timeless lassitude on words et de la campagne infinie, and by the infinite countryside landscape. It goes through all the couplets, storytelling ones or speech ones, 
in an irregular way. The reappearance of the main stem, as well as other punctual techniques at the recurrent rhythm of dotted eighth notes and sixteen notes that you, you could notice when we, we heard the recording, or the chromatic movement in the piano part throughout the melody, participate for the total construction of poetic evocation by recreating networks of tones throughout the work. I suggest now to listen to a performance of this song by Sandrine Pio and Jos van Immersel in order to listen to the moving of the tempi and the flexibility of the accompanying motifs to feel this creation of a, a time-space. The unit of the piece is carried by the musical material in reply to the poetic material. This motto seems to be treated as a significant aspect of the language, language spleen, arriving at a paroxysm in final evocation and presented always barely shamed. Another effect is also present, raised according to this evocation of the poem, the work on the flow of time, as its stretching, its widening, its acceleration, thanks to the techniques of juxtaposition, of superimposing, and of elast elasticity of the quick motifs. Breaks and contrasts created by different species, unforeseen accents coming from non-regular poetic stresses, make of spleen a succession of different musical instances. The time always seems unstable, under every line. Even if the regular metric of the octosyllable is observable, then this instability is overlapped by reiterations of musical motifs. The temporal perception is flustered by this not foreseeable, irregular reminiscence of the theme. As movements of energy more than mo development of semantic material, we feel, more, we feel a more flexible musical temporality linked to the deletion of marks of tonality also and of harmonic rhythm which underlay it in an unstable way. If the length of this piece is finally very short, just a few minutes, the musical time recalls at the same time haste and infinity, heavy trouble and hardened passion, speeding the time up and dilating the instant. 
the understanding of linguistics and poetics appear very essential for such a work, necessary, intrinsically linked to the development of this language in arts, poetical or musical language. This research wants to bring elements in understanding the way Claude Debussy worked out his language, notably his treatment of the musical material, his harmonic organization, and his temporal behavior in music. Rhythmic anticipation, juxtaposition, overlapping with delighted or stressed motifs show how to use temporality in a very short space. Lately, minimalist format of prelude for piano, composed in the year 1909-1913, gets closer to that of this melody and seems to be a pianistic culmination in this maturity of the musical language of the composer. And I want to show a parallel between his work on the time with the motives. Already in this song, Spleen, we can appreciate the instant which relates Vladimir Yankelevich. Each prelude immobilizes one minute of the universal life of things, an instant of the history of the world, and it stops this universal life out of any future, of any succession, without relation neither with before nor with after. These pictures, at the same time eternal and momentary, form a heterogeneous tapestry of escaped impression. As the aquarelle we just heard seems to um, do as a premonitory thing. Thank you. For more information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.